Hi. In this section of the course, we are going to start uh, talking about polynomials. So, so far we have not discussed this, but now is the time because we have finished number theory and there are a lot of similarities between number theory and polynomials. So, let's get started. We'll use some standard notation for polynomials. So, here in this section we'll call D. We'll use the symbol D to refer to the set of integers set of integers and Q as the set of rational numbers, rational numbers, R for the set of real numbers and C for the set of complex numbers. Let's get to the definition of polynomial. So let N be a non-negative integer, N be a non-negative integer. Then the expression a n x bar n plus a n minus 1 x bar n minus 1 and so on. You get lower and lower powers till a1 x plus a naught. This expression is called a univariate polynomial. Here all the a i's belong to the set d which is the set of integers. Each of the coefficients belong to the set of integers and i basically goes from 0 to n. The set of all such polynomials, set of all such polynomials will be given by the symbol d of x. So it's a set of polynomials with integer coefficients. That's why we are saying it is d of x. And we can represent specific polynomials in this set with symbols like f of x, g of x, and so on. So basically, this can be called f of x, and it's a subset, or it's an element of the set of all polynomials d of x, where d is the set of integers, and these are all integer polynomials, because the coefficients belong to the set of integers. Right? Correct. Here, now, this term is known as the leading term. Leading term, the largest degree term is the leading term and a n is basically the leading coefficient. Leading coefficient. The integer n is known as the degree of the polynomial. Degree of the polynomial. <laughs> so now degree is defined for any polynomial except for the zero polynomial. What is the zero polynomial? where each of the coefficients a n, a n minus 1 and all are all equal to 0, then that polynomial is called the 0 polynomial. So degree is not defined for that. right? Also, we have uh, the idea that if two polynomials fx and gx, fx and gx are identically equal are identically equal. The two polynomials are equal if and only if then the coefficients of coefficients of the same term of the same term in both fx and gx are same. In both fx and gx are equal. So we will call two polynomials equal to each other if their coefficients are all the same. So uh, for each term, so for each power of x, their coefficients are matching. Now, obviously, you already know how to do basic operations on polynomials like addition, multiplication, and so on. So we'll go to some standard results, which are not so obvious. So first one is this. Let f of x and g of x be non-zero polynomials, non-zero polynomials in d of x. Basically, because we are saying it is non-zero polynomials in d of x, we know that these are integer coefficient polynomials. Then we have if fx plus gx is not zero, is not the zero polynomial, then degree of 
एफ एक्स प्लस जी एक्स इज बेसिकली लेस देन इक्वल टू मैक्स ऑफ डिग्री ऑफ एफ एफ एक्स एंड डिग्री ऑफ जी ऑफ एक्स so basically what this means is when you add two polynomials the degree of the polynomial has to be less than or equal to the maximum value of the degree of either of f of x or degree of g of x so the higher polynomial's degree will what is what will come as the degree of your f of x plus g of x the second result is degree of f of x times g of x it's simply the sum of the degrees of f and g degree of f of x plus degree of g of x these properties can be easily checked by taking some couple of polynomials and checking what happens when you add and multiply these polynomials right the next thing that we we'll look at is division with remainder and greatest common factors so usually these concepts are very similar to what we see for integers however there is a difference there is a difference between the sets q r and c between the sets q r c and the set d or set z of integers what is the difference division can be performed in the first three sets division can be done in q r and c but not in general in z but not in d in general why because when you divide polynomials if even if they are integer coefficient polynomials the division may not lead to an integer polynomial in general right. we'll see some examples of this but division can easily be done in the other three rational numbers real numbers and complex number sets the division can easily be done because these three are similar we sometimes use the symbol f let f denote the union of q r and c and we will say our polynomials belong to the set f of x px let's say belongs to this set what that means is the polynomials coefficients could be rational numbers real numbers or even complex numbers so we are combining these three sets and calling it the set f right so the concept of exact division is similar in the set f similar to what we have in integers so let's just write down what the concept is suppose f of x and g of x belong to the set f of x capital f of x basically the coefficients can be rational real or complex and g of x is not zero g of x is not zero now if there exists if there exists h of x belonging to capital f of x such that such that we have f of x is equal to g of x times h of x right then we say that g of x divides f of x and we call g of x as a factor of f of x and f of x is known as a multiple of g of x notice this is exactly like we when we deal with integers if there is no such h of x such that we can write f of x as the product of g of x and h of x then we say that g of x does not divide f of x in that case right okay let's list down some commonly used properties this is if g of x divides h of x and h of x divides f of x then it follows that g of x will divide f of x so this is the transitive property then we can also say that if g of x divides f of x and g of x divides h of x then for any alpha x and beta x 
alpha x and beta x belonging to f of x. We have if g of x divides f of x and g of x also divides h of x, then for any choice of alpha and beta from the set of polynomials f of x, we can always say that g of x will divide f of x times alpha x plus h g of x plus h of x times beta x. h of x times beta x. Now, this is a pretty obvious result because g of x divides this and g of x divides this. No matter what polynomials will multiply, alpha and beta, the whole thing will always be divisible by g of x, right? So, try to understand what we are saying here. This will form the basis of an important property as we go ahead, right? The fourth one is this. If g of x divides f of x, then either f of x is 0 or degree of g is less than or equal to degree of f, right? Now, now, g of x could divide f of x and it could be that f of x is a zero polynomial. The zero polynomial is a multiple of any other polynomial. Like you can always say that g of x, any f of x divides zero, that's possible. But if it is not a zero polynomial, then the degree of g must be smaller than the degree of f or equal to the degree of f. So that is what this is saying. In addition, we can even say that if g of x divides f of x, and f of x divides g of x, then f of x can be written as a multiple of g of x. Usually in integers, we say that if a divides b and b divides a, then a and b are equal to integers, right? In polynomials, we can say this, that if g of x divides f of x and f of x divides g of x, then f of x and g of x are similar, except maybe there's a difference of a constant, right? Now, this was for uh, polynomials in the set capital F of x. We have a slightly different version of the same property for integer polynomials. So we can call it four star. We say let f of x and g of x belong to the set of polynomials z of x or the set of integer polynomials such that f of x divides g of x and g of x divides f of x. So usually we should say that f of x and g of x are similar to each other or are same. In this case, we will say f of x is equal to plus or minus g of x. Now, in the normal set of polynomials where we were taking rational numbers or real numbers or complex numbers, we said that this there was a C here. If a property like this was satisfied, f of x must be equal to C times g of x. Here, however, since division cannot be performed in integer sets, if the product of two integers is one, then the two integers can only be plus or minus one. So basically you have f of x should be c1 times g of x and g of x should be c2 times f of x. And from here, we can conclude that c, c1 and c2 can be plus or minus 1, basically. So that is the property here. Then we look at division with remainder. So what is this concept? Division with remainder. So let f of x and g of x belong to the set capital F of x and g of x is not equal to 0, then there exist polynomials q of x and r of x, q of x and r of x in capital F of x, 
such that such that f of x will be equal to q of x times g of x plus r of x where r of x can be 0 or degree of r must be less than degree of g of, g of x. Right? This is known as the quotient polynomial and this is known as the remainder polynomial. And obviously the degree of the remainder must be less than the degree of the divisor. Right? So this is again very similar to what we saw in integer when we did integer division right okay now let's look at the next property we have let f of x and g of x be two polynomials two polynomials in capital f of x that are not both zero that are not both zero. Okay. So now we denote a set, denote a set S and the set S is basically combinations of f of x with alpha x and g of x with beta x. Alpha and beta are two random polynomials from f of x and the set S is basically the linear combination when we multiply f of x with alpha x and g of x with beta x such that alpha x and beta x belong to the set capital F of x. So basically, as long as you choose any alpha x and beta x in the set capital F of x, we are making the set S of all polynomials like this, right? Now, the result says there exists, then there exists a unique polynomial d of x, a unique polynomial d of x, which belongs to the set f of x, which belongs to the set s, the set that we have just now constructed. So there is one polynomial d of x, which belongs to the set s with leading coefficient one, leading coefficient one, such that d of x exactly divides exactly divides all polynomials all polynomials in s so what is what are we saying here we are saying that as long as you construct the s set where fx and gx have been multiplied with two elements of the capital F of x, we have constructed this set S, then there must exist one polynomial d of x with leading coefficient 1, such that the d of x in this set will divide all the other polynomials in this set. So d of x will be like a common divisor for all the polynomials in this set. Right? So from here, what we will say, is we'll be able to construct the idea of GCD of two polynomials. You should realize that here D of X is usually going to be the polynomial with lowest possible degree in the set S with leading coefficient one, right? So for example, using this property, let's see what we can get. So our set S is the set of polynomials alpha X F of X plus beta X, g of x such that alpha x and beta x belong to capital F of x. And we are saying there exists, there exists a d of x belonging to s with leading coefficient 1, with leading coefficient 1 such that d of x exactly divides all elements of S. Exactly divides all the elements of S. Now, what does this mean in practice? So we can pick alpha X to be equal to one and beta X to be equal to the zero polynomial. 
and we will say that d of x must divide 1 time f of x plus 0 times g of x. So this implies that d of x divides f of x. And similarly, by taking alpha as 0 and beta as 1, we can also get d of x divides g of x. So what we get from here is that d of x is a common factor or a common divisor of both f of x and g of x. Of f of x and g of x, right? On the other hand, we know that d of x itself is an element of the set S, right? So what we can say, there must exist alpha x and beta x such that there must exist alpha x and beta x such that d of x is equal to alpha x times f of x plus beta x times g of x, right? This result must be true because d of x belongs to the set and every element of set can be written like this, right? And we have already concluded that d of x is a common factor of f and g. Common factor of f of x and g of x. So we have these results. So if d1 of x is any other common factor, any other common factor of f and g, common factor of f, x, and g of x, we will be able to show that d1 of x will divide d of x. And therefore, degree of d1 should be less than equal to degree of d, right? We should be able to say that d1x is any other common factor of this. So d1x clearly divides d of x, right? So degree of d1 should be less than degree of d, which implies, therefore, d of x is the unique, unique common factor of ffx and g of x, common factor of f of x and g of x with highest degree, with the highest possible degree. Highest degree. Among all the common factors, d of x should have the highest degree because just now we are seeing that degree of d1 should be less than degree of d, right? And leading coefficient 1. And leading coefficient 1. So therefore, we can now say that d of x is basically the GCD of f of x and g of x. GCD is greatest common divisor. So we are proving here that this g of x is basically the GCD of f of x and g of x, right? So from this, we can say that when f of x and g of x have greatest common divisor is 1, when d of x is 1 basically, then f of x and g of x are said to be co-prime, are co-prime to each other. And now we also got, got something similar to Bezout's identity, which was true for integers. So we can say if f of x, g of x belongs to capital F of x and not both of them are zero, not both of them are zero, then there exists, then there exists alpha x and beta x belonging to f such that fx times alpha x plus gx times beta x should be equal to the GCD of f of x and g of x. We have already shown that it was equal to d of x and d of x is the GCD, right? If fx and gx are co-prime, the GCD is basically 1, and then we can say that there exists, there exists alpha x and beta x such that fx times alpha x plus gx times beta x must be equal to 1. This is the Bezout's identity 
which is similar to what we get in number theory, right? So that is a pretty important application. Now let's go on to some more standard properties. So this is property eight, any common divisor, any common divisor or common factor of ffx and g of x must exactly divide must exactly divide the gcd or d of x this is an obvious result so we'll not discuss it anymore then if f of x and h of x are co prime or their gcd is one and similarly g of x and h of x are also co-prime, then what is the GCD of F of X multiplied by G of X with H of X? So obviously this will also be co-prime, right? The next one is, suppose G of X divides F of X, H of X and G of X is co-prime with H of X then it follows from here that g of x must divide f of x, right? So these are standard GCD properties. Remember that polynom for polynomials with integer coefficients, we cannot define GCD. Here throughout our discussion, we have defined f of x and g of x as polynomials in the set capital F of x, which is rational numbers, real numbers, and complex coefficients, right? Because Bezot's identity and the GCD concepts here don't exactly hold for integer polynomials. So we'll discuss them separately in integer polynomials later. The next idea that we'll talk about is irreducible polynomials. Irreducible polynomials and basically unique factorization of polynomials. So what is irreducible? So we'll say let P of X belong to capital F of X and degree of p is greater than or equal to 1. If p of x cannot be factored, cannot be factored into the product of, into the product of two polynomials, two polynomials of positive degrees, of positive degrees in F, then P is an irreducible polynomial. Then P is an irreducible polynomial in the set capital F of X. Polynomial in capital F of X. Now remember that if you change the set f of x, then irreducibility can also change according to that, right? For example, x square plus 1 in the set r of x, when you take real coefficients, x square plus 1 cannot be expressed as a product of two polynomials with real coefficients. However, x square plus 1 can be expressed as x plus i and x minus i. When you change the set to c of x, the set of complex numbers, x square plus 1 is not irreducible. It is irreducible in the set R of x, but not irreducible in the set C of x. So if you change the set, the irreducibility criteria might change, right, for a particular polynomial. Okay, let's look at the property, this one. There must be, there must be an irreducible irreducible polynomial factor. There must be an irreducible polynomial factor for any non-constant for any non-constant polynomial in f of x. So basically you can think of irreducible polynomials like the prime factors that we see in number theory. And we are saying that any non-constant polynomial must be written as a product of irreducible polynomials in the set, right? Then let P of X 
belong to capital F of X be an irreducible polynomial. Irreducible polynomial. Then for any F of X, for any F of X belonging to the same set capital F of X, there is either P of X should divide the F of X or P of X should be co-prime with F of X. This is an obvious property. Like P of X is like a prime number or prime factor. P of X will either divide another random polynomial or it will be co-prime with it, right? Okay. Then we can say for, huh, we can conclude from here that for any a belonging to the set F, the set F is basically the set of rationals, reals, and complex numbers. Clearly, X minus A is an irreducible polynomial. Irreducible polynomial in F of X. Polynomial in F of X. Think about it. There is no other factorization of X minus A possible because it is itself a degree one polynomial. So for any A belonging to the set F, X minus A is clearly an irreducible polynomial. And basically that means that F contains, since F contains an infinite number of A's, infinite number of elements, which are basically A, we can say that there are an infinite number of irreducible polynomials, right? So that is our next property. We say that there is an infinite number of infinite number of irreducible polynomials with leading coefficient one with leading coefficient one in f of x. Why? Because for every A belonging to F, X minus A is an irreducible polynomial belonging to F of X. So therefore, there will be infinite numbers of these, right? Okay. The next property states that let P of X be an irreducible polynomial, irreducible polynomial in F of X. If the product of two polynomials, if the product of two polynomials f of x and g of x, f of x and g of x in capital F of x is divisible by P of x, is divisible by P of x, then obviously then P of X must divide at least one of F of X or G of X. Must divide at least one of F of X and G of X. That must be true because P of X is dividing the overall products of F of X and G of X. So it must divide at least one of them. The next property is known as unique factorization which is a standard property. What we say here is that a polynomial f of x, a polynomial f of x of any positive degree, of any positive degree in capital F of x can be decomposed, can be factored into the product of into the product of a constant in f a constant in f and a finite number of finite number of irreducible polynomials irreducible polynomials with leading coefficient 1 
with leading coefficient one in f of x. So basically what are we saying? Any polynomial P of x can be written as a product of a constant capital A and some finite number of irreducible polynomials in f of x. Like depends on the degree of P. If the degree of P is K, there should be K irreducible factors here with leading coefficient one and there should be a constant here which decides whether the leading coefficient of P of x is one or not, right? And what we also know that this factorization of P of x is going to be unique, just like any number can be divided and can be factored in a unique way with prime numbers. Similarly here, this factorization is also unique. Okay. The next concept we will look at is very important from an Olympiad problem solving perspective. This is the concept of polynomials modulo a prime number. Polynomials modulo a prime number. So we are going to talk about integer coefficient polynomials here. And so we are going to talk about integer polynomials and a prime number P. Integer coefficient polynomials and P is a fixed prime number. Fixed prime. So if, if the coefficients of corresponding terms If the coefficients of corresponding terms of two polynomials, two polynomials, f of x and g of x, f of x and g of x are all congruent modulo p, congruent modulo p, then we say that f of x and g of x are congruent modulo p or are identical modulo p. So what is the idea here? We take the coefficients of corresponding terms of the two polynomials f of x and g of x. So if you have x power n term, you'll take the x power n coefficient in f and g. And if these numbers are always congruent modulo p, then the overall polynomial is said to be congruent to each other modulo p. Now, the other thing that we can say here is if the coefficients of f of x are not all divisible by p, are not all divisible by p, then, then the highest power, the highest power in which, in which, the coefficients are not divisible by p are not divisible by p is called the degree of is called degree of f of x modulo p modulo p so what is the meaning of this term basically we have to look for the highest power where the coefficient is not divisible by p. So the highest power where that happens is going to be the degree of the function modulo p, right? So let's take a few examples. So if you have this polynomial f of x is equal to 30 x power 4 plus 6 x cube plus 9. If you take it modulo 5, right, you will realize that this is divisible by, by 5. This is not divisible by 5. So it is 1 modulo 5. So the degree of this polynomial is 3 modulo 5. Because the highest power which is not divisible by 5 is 3. Right? Similarly, if you take it modulo 2, then the degree is 0. Because both the terms here, 30 and 6, are divisible by 2. So the only term that is not divisible by 2 is the constant term. So degree is 0. But if you take modulo 3, the degree is undefined. Why is it undefined? Because actually all the terms here, all the coefficients here are divisible by 3. So there is no term which is 
not divisible by three in this polynomial, so you cannot define the degrees. Let's take some properties of polynomials. So uh, polynomials modulo a prime. So we'll say that if fx is congruent to gx modulo p, then gx is congruent to fx modulo p. So the property is basically reflexive or commutative. If f of x is congruent to g of x mod p and g of x is congruent to h of x mod p, then we can say that f of x will be congruent to h of x mod p. So this is the transitive property, which is also valid. And then we have how to do addition and subtraction and multiplication basically. So if f of x is congruent to g of x mod p and f1 of x is congruent to g1 of x mod p, right? Then we can say that f of x plus minus f1 of x will be congruent to g of x plus minus g1 of x mod p. And also the product of f of x and f1 of x will also be congruent to the product of g of x and g1 of x mod p. So that is how you do operations on congruent polynomials. And finally, you have a last property, which is f of x whole power p, f of x whole power p will be congruent to f of x power p modulo p. You can use Fermat's little theorem to try to prove this property. You can try it out and you should be able to prove this. Now, all of this discussion was for polynomials modulo a prime number. You cannot take a composite number, composite number M, and expect all of these properties to be true. The properties 17, 16, 17, 18 are still true if your modulo was with a composite number. However, property 19 is not true for P being replaced with M. You cannot replace P with M and expect property 19 to work. It cannot be a composite number. Now, the theory for this section of the course is sort of done. Now, what do I want to do is discuss some problems. Let's look at some examples for today's session. So. The first question is this, express x power 4 plus 3x square minus 2x plus 3 as the difference, as the difference of squares of two integer coefficient polynomials, two integer coefficient polynomials of unequal degrees of unequal degrees. So the question is to write this as a difference of two polynomial squares, but the polynomial should have unequal degrees. So basically you have to write it like this. 2x plus 3 is equal to f of x square minus g of x square. And since they have to have different degrees and the degree of this polynomial is 4, we should immediately be able to say that degree of this polynomial should be 2 and degree of this polynomial must be less than 2. So we can take in general the degree here is 1. Once you decide this because of the unequal degrees, we can just express this like this. This is a 2 degree polynomial in general. Why did we take the leading coefficient 1? Because in this polynomial also leading coefficient is 1. So this is my f of x in general and this is my g of x cx plus d, and you have four variables, a, b, c, d. You are supposed to simplify by expanding and getting equations on a, b, c, d. The reason we are able to equate and get equations on a, b, c, d is because we know the identity that if two polynomials are equal, then their terms of the same power should have the same coefficients, right? We know the coefficients on the left-hand side, so we'll be able to form equations like this. After doing a little bit of algebra, you should get equations like this. 
टू ए इज इक्वल टू जीरो ए स्क्वायर प्लस टू बी माइनस सी स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू थ्री टू ए बी माइनस टू सी डी इज इक्वल टू माइनस टू एंड बी स्क्वायर माइनस डी स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू थ्री और यूजिंग दीज इक्वेशन वी कैन सॉल्व फॉर ए बी सी डी एंड फाइनली यू विल गेट एफ ऑफ एक्स विल बी इक्वल टू एक्स स्क्वायर प्लस टू एंड जी ऑफ एक्स विल बी इक्वल टू एक्स प्लस वन दैट बिकम्स आर सोल्यूशन लेट्स लुक एट अनदर प्रॉब्लम दिस इज फाइंड All real coefficient polynomials f of x satisfying satisfying the result f of x square is equal to f of x whole square. We have to find all possible real coefficient polynomials which satisfy this condition. So let's take a general polynomial f of x as a n x bar n plus a n minus one x bar n minus one, and so on till a one x plus a zero. Now looking at this result, you will be able to prove prove that a n minus one is equal to a n minus two is equal to a n is equal to a zero and is equal to zero. you should be able to prove this the way we prove it is we assume a contradiction we prove by con we do a proof by contradiction where we say that okay let's say one of these terms suppose ai where ai where i is going from 0 to n minus 1 are not all zero are not all zero and let k less than n be the largest number largest subscript such that ak is not equal to 0 so we are taking ak as the largest subscript which is not zero so the polynomial will start looking like an xn plus ak xk Plus maybe last term a one x plus a naught. This is my polynomial f of x. Now if you just calculate this, you use this result now, right? You will get something like this: a n x bar two n plus a k x bar two k plus a one x square plus a naught should be equal to a n x bar n plus a k x bar k plus A one x plus a naught whole square. This is the result that we get. Now compare the coefficients of x power n plus k on both sides. If you compare the coefficients of x power n plus k on both sides, the LHS coefficient is zero because there is no such term here. But the RHS there is a coefficient here of x power n plus k. That is two a n a k. So we are getting two a n a k should be zero, which implies that a k should be zero because a n was not equal to zero, right? And now we are getting a k is zero. However, we had assumed while starting the proof by contradiction that a k was non-zero, right? So this is our contradiction. Therefore, not all of the all of the coefficient a i. Where i goes from zero to n minus one are all zero. So that means that our function will become simply a n x bar n. And now using the property again, we will derive that a n must be one. You will get something like a n is equal to a n square. A n must be one since a n cannot be zero. So your answer is f of x is equal to x bar n, and that is the only possible function that satisfies this condition. right let's look at another problem let n be greater than equal to 0 it is an integer prove that prove that x plus 1 power 2n plus 1 plus x power n plus 2 is divisible by x square plus x plus one. That is our question. 
So the way we do this is by induction on N. Induction on N. So we can easily check when N is equal to zero, the conclusion is obviously true because you have X plus one plus X squared, which is obviously divisible by X squared plus X plus one, right? So we will assume, assume that the conclusion is true for n minus 1, is true for n minus 1, which means what? Which means if you put n minus 1 here, you get x plus 1 power 2n minus 1 plus x power n plus 1 is divisible by x squared plus x plus 1. We have this. Now we have to prove the conclusion for n, not just n minus 1. So basically the expression for n is this only, x plus 1 power 2n plus 1 plus x power n plus 2. We have to use some algebra here. So what I will do is try to convert it to this form. So I'll take an x plus 1 square outside. This is becoming x plus 1 power 2n minus 1. Plus, I will write this as x times x power n plus 1, right? Now, think about what we can do to this expression x plus 1 square is what? x square plus 2x plus 1. I can split it like this. x square plus x plus 1 times x plus 1 power 2n plus 1 minus 1 plus x times x plus 1 power 2n minus 1 plus x into x power n plus 1, right? What have I done here? I have taken the x plus 1 whole square and written it as x square plus x plus 1 plus x, right? and broken down the term into two terms, right? Now, what we can say here clearly, we have x square plus x plus one into x plus one power two n minus one, or I'll write it here, x square plus x plus one times x plus one power two n minus one. And then the next term is this, right? These two terms. From here, we can easily take an x common and we have x plus 1 power 2n minus 1 plus x power n plus 1, right? Now, from our induction hypothesis, we know that x plus 1 power 2n minus 1 plus x power n plus 1 is divisible by this. So, this factor is divisible by x square plus x plus 1. And obviously, this factor is clearly divisible by x square plus x plus 1. So basically, that means that our overall thing is divisible by x square plus x plus 1, which completes the induction. And therefore, we have established the conclusion for n. And the statement, therefore, must be true for all possible n. So that finishes off our proof, right? Okay. Now, let's look at another question. Question 4. We have let f of x be equal to x power 4 plus x cube minus 3x squared plus x plus 2. We have to prove that for any positive integer n, any positive integer n, the polynomial, the polynomial f of x power n whole raised to n has at least at least one negative coefficient at least one negative coefficient okay so we'll do it by a direct proof let's say f of x whole power n is basically what it is x power 4 plus x cube minus 3x square plus x plus 2 multiplied by terms like this n times, right, plus x plus 2, and there are n terms like this. Now, we will calculate the coefficient of x power 3 in f of x whole power n. So, how do you calculate the coefficient of x power 3? You can do it by, in two different ways. We can take the x cube term in one factor x cube term in one factor, multiply with the constant terms of other factors, multiply it with constant terms in the other factor.
So how many terms like this will come? There will be n terms because we could select x cube term from any one of these n factors. So the coefficient here that we will get is n times, and we multiply the constant term in the remaining factor. So it will be 2 power n minus 1, right? 2 power n minus 1 will come when we select the constant term in all of these factors. And we are taking the x cube term here and multiplying with the constant in the other. And there are n such terms. The other way to get x cube is by selecting x square term in one factor, in one factor, and multiply it with the x term in another factor, in another factor, and multiply with constant terms in remaining factors, constants in remaining factors, right? So number of ways of selecting the x term is one way, is n ways because you have n factors. Once you have selected the x term from one of them, you can select the x square term in one of them. You can select the x term in another factor in n minus one ways. So totally you have n times n minus one. And finally, x square term here had minus three and x term here had one. So you have a minus three here. And the remaining terms are constant terms. So minus three times two power n minus two, right? So this should be the coefficient of x cube that you get in the second way. So the overall coefficient of x cube is becoming n times two power n minus one plus n into n minus one minus three times two power n minus two, right? So we can say n times two power n minus two is common and we'll get here two and we get a plus n minus one into minus three, right? So this becomes minus three n plus three. So you get minus three n plus five n times two power n minus two, right? So this is the coefficient of x cube in the product in f of x power n. Coefficient of x cube in f of x whole power n. Now, this, this number here is obviously negative. Negative when n is greater than or equal to 2, right? So the coefficient of x cube in f of x power n will obviously be negative if n is greater than or equal to 2. And if n is equal to 1, f of x power 1 already has a negative term. That is the coefficient of x square, right? So the conclusion is obviously true. It has at least one negative coefficient if n was 1. And the conclusion is also true for n greater than 2 because we are getting coefficient of x cube is becoming negative in that case, right? So this is the way in which we have completed the proof here. Let's look at one last example. Uh, basically, this is the question. Okay, so we are given a polynomial f of x is equal to ax square plus bx plus c. a is not equal to 0. We have to prove that for each positive integer n, for each positive integer n, there exists, there exists at most one polynomial, there exists at most one polynomial g of x of degree n such that f of g of x is equal to g of f of x. So basically we have to show that given f of x being this quadratic polynomial for any integer n, there exists at most one polynomial g of x of degree n such that this result is true, right? So let's say the gx polynomial looks like this, bn x bar n plus bn minus 1 x bar n minus 1 and so on till b1x plus b naught, 
this is a degree n polynomial g of x which satisfies this condition. So you can say f of g of x should be equal to f of f is what a of a x square a g of x square plus b g of x plus c right okay and what is g of f of x that is b n f of x power n so that is a x square plus b x plus c power n plus b n minus 1 a x square plus b x plus c power n minus 1 and so on right now if you say that these two are equal then all the coefficients of these must match right the corresponding coefficients must be equal so let's compare the coefficient of x power 2n on both sides right so x power 2n coefficient here will come when we do g of x square right and g of x is this so you should get b n square multiplied by a right there is no other way to get x power 2n so you'll get a times b n square here let's think about what happens here we will get a a power n times b n right here a power n times b n on the other side so using this we will realize that b n must be okay i have written it incorrectly i should write it as a power n b n right here you get a power n here and multiplied by b n you get a power n b n so using this you can solve for b n and we, we get b n is a power n minus one right so what is the conclusion here that if for a certain n like we know that gx is a degree n polynomial that satisfies this then the leading coefficient of gx must be a power n minus one right so basically the form of gx that we have gotten is a power n minus one b power n not b power n x power n plus b n minus one x power n minus one so on till b1 x plus b0 right so now what we'll do is we'll try to prove that there is only one g of x of degree n and there cannot be two different g of x like that right so we'll try to prove it by contradiction so we'll say if for a certain n there are two distinct there are two distinct polynomials g1x and g2x of degree n satisfying the conditions of the problem satisfying f of g of x is equal to g of f of x right then since leading coefficient leading coefficient of both g1x and g2x must be a power n minus 1 the degree k of the polynomial of the polynomial h of x let's call h of x as g1x minus g2x both g1x and g2x have degree n but the problem is that they have the same leading coefficient a power n minus 1 right so h of x which is g1x minus g2x must have degree less than n degree less than n it cannot be n because the first term gets cancelled so degree k is basically coming out to be less than n right so now what we'll do is we'll take h of f of x that will become g1 f of x minus g2 f of x which can be rewritten as f of g1 x minus f of g2 x because that is the property f of g1 x should be g g of g1 of f of x right g1 of f of x i'm replacing with this right now f of g of g1 x minus f of g2 x what is that 
that is basically putting it in the quadratic function, we have a g one x square plus b g one x plus c minus a g two x square plus b g two x plus c. So when you subtract this, we will get h of f of x is equal to a g one x square minus g two x square plus b g one x minus g two x. The c term got cancelled, and then finally we can take common g one x minus g two x, and we are getting a g one x plus a g two x plus b. This is my h of f of x, right? So let's call this as t of x. And we have this is same as h of x. So we are getting the result h of f of x is equal to h of x times t of x, right? At this step, we can try to compare the degrees on both sides. Compare the degrees of both sides. So what is h of f of x? Remember that h of x had degree of k, right? And k was less than n. That is what we had gotten earlier. h of f of x, where instead of x, we are putting ax squared plus bx plus c. So therefore, this degree will become 2k, right? Because it is degree k, and instead of x, we replace with x square and all. So the degree on the left-hand side becomes 2k. And the degree here is simply k plus degree of t. What is the degree of t? G1x has degree n, g2x has degree n. So it is k plus n. So from here, we get k is equal to n, which is a direct contradiction. We are getting k is equal to n from here, and we had already de de decided that k was less than n. So since it is a contradiction, we can now say that there cannot be two different polynomials, g1x and g2x, which satisfy the conditions of the problem. right? That concludes our proof, and basically we come to the end of the session today. Uh, we have finished the first part of polynomials. We'll continue in the next section, and we'll discuss roots of polynomials and some standard results there. That's all for now. I'll see you next time.